today, let's talk about molecular orbital theory. Molecular orbital theory is the most modern and sophisticated model to describe bonding in a molecule. It's not as easy to get your head around as other models of bonding, like valence bond, for example. But once you get the hang of it, it really has some amazing and powerful features. I think molecular orbitals are best understood by comparing them to atomic orbitals, with which you're already familiar. You remember those, right? Atomic orbitals are standing waveforms around a single nucleus. Well, molecular orbitals are also standing electron waveforms, but this time not around a single atomic nucleus, but around all of the atomic nuclei that make up the molecule. Now, you probably remember that there are certain principles which are common to each of the various types of atomic orbitals. For example, S-type atomic orbitals are spherical in shape and don't have planar nodes. P-type atomic orbitals are dumbbell-shaped and always have a planar node. By comparison, there are sigma-type and pi-type molecular orbitals, each of which has its own unique characteristics of shape. Another important way in which atomic orbitals and molecular orbitals are similar is that you can draw energy level diagrams for both of them. You'll remember that for atomic orbitals we would draw the energy level of the 1s, then the 2s, then the set of 2p's, then the 3s, then the 3p's, and so on. In similar fashion we can draw energy level diagrams for molecular orbitals. Here's an example. Now you'll recall that for atomic orbitals it was possible for two electrons to adopt the same waveform, or in other words, occupy the same orbital. Well, the same is true for molecular orbitals. Here's how the electrons would fill, one at a time, into successively higher in energy atomic orbitals. And now, here's how the electrons would fill into the molecular orbitals. You can see that the way in which the electrons fill these orbitals is much the same. We'll dive into the specific aspects of molecular orbital theory in more detail in the following slides. Let's talk first about the shapes of molecular orbitals. The first important point to understand is that molecular orbitals can be, and often are, spread over the whole molecule. In other theories of molecular bonding, we imagine the electrons located between the individual atoms of the molecule. And we talk about individual bonds between atoms as if the electrons in each bond were completely independent of the electrons in any other area of the molecule. This isn't true in molecular orbital theory. And in fact, this is probably the hardest idea for newcomers to understand. In MO theory, the bonding in the molecule is not thought of as resulting from electrons between individual atoms. Instead, we think of the electrons as filling a bunch of molecular orbitals, and then the bonding is the overall effect resulting from the distribution through space of all the electrons in the molecule. We look not at individual bonds, but at the so-called electron density at individual points around the molecule. If one molecular orbital places a lot of electron density between two of the atoms in the molecule, this molecular orbital is called a bonding type orbital. Why? Because the net effect of its electron density is to pull the nuclei of the atoms together to create the effect we call bonding. Other molecular orbitals may distribute the electron density in ways that pull the nuclei apart. And this is where molecular orbital theory seems strange at first blush. When electron density of the molecular orbital is not between the nuclei, but on opposite sides of the nuclei, the electrons in this molecular orbital are actually pulling the nuclei away from each other. So these kinds of molecular orbitals are called anti-bonding orbitals, for obvious reasons, I guess. So the amount of bonding in the molecule is just the total effect of the electrons in all these bonding and anti-bonding type orbitals. 
If more electrons are in bonding type orbitals than in antibonding type orbitals, then the net effect is that the nuclei are pulled together and the molecule holds together. If there are more electrons in antibonding type orbitals than in bonding type orbitals, then the molecule is pulled apart. In other words, it's not stable. Of course, for stable molecules, there are always more electrons in bonding type orbitals than in antibonding orbitals, and the molecule holds together. Now let's take a look at a simple example of a bonding type orbital. Here's a diatomic molecule like dihydrogen. It turns out that the lowest energy molecular orbital for dihydrogen looks like this. Let's swing it around in space so you can see it from different angles. Notice that the majority of electron density is gathered between the two nuclei, pulling the nuclei together. And in fact, this would be a good time to remind ourselves of the bond axis. Because the electron density is largely between the nuclei, this is a bonding type orbital. And because the electron density is in the bond axis and is symmetrical around the bond axis, we call this type of molecular orbital a sigma type orbital. Now sigma type orbitals come in two flavors, bonding, which we've already seen, and antibonding. Let's take a look at an antibonding type sigma orbital. And in fact, it turns out that the next highest orbital in energy in the hydrogen molecule is a sigma type antibonding orbital. Let's swing it around so you can look at it. Notice that it shares the common characteristic of all sigma type molecular orbitals in that it has electron density in and around the bond axis. But notice that unlike the bonding sigma type orbital, the antibonding sigma type orbital has most of its electron density outside the nuclei rather than between them. This pulls the nuclei apart and undoes any bonding that might result from electrons in bonding orbitals. You might be amazed to hear that the shapes and patterns for molecular orbitals are different for every molecule. That's not like atomic orbitals, is it? Even though different atoms have different numbers of electrons, you could always use the same set of atomic orbitals for all the atoms. In that respect, we enjoyed a relatively simple situation looking back on it for atomic orbitals, didn't we? For molecular orbitals, every molecule has a unique set with different shapes and nodes and so on. So from this perspective, molecular orbitals are a lot more complicated than atomic orbitals, aren't they? And for this reason, predicting the shapes of molecular orbitals for any given molecule is usually beyond the scope of a beginning chemistry course. There are some patterns, though, that are worth remembering. For example, you've now learned the common characteristic of sigma orbitals. But the shapes you've already seen are not the only possible sigma-type orbitals. Any orbital that has electron density in the bond axis and around the bond axis is called a sigma-type orbital. There are some funny-looking sigma-type orbitals from other molecules. Here are some examples. Take a look at them and assure yourself that they are indeed of the sigma-type. Can you tell which is bonding and which is antibonding? Well, here's the answer. The bonding one has electron density between the nuclei, pulling them together. The antibonding one has electron density away from the nuclei, and therefore pull the molecule apart. Another common type of molecular orbitals is called the pi type. Pi type molecular orbitals have the common characteristic of having a planar node in the bond axis. That means there's no electron density in the bond axis. And in fact, the electron density is above and below the bond axis. Now, just as with sigma type orbitals, we can have bonding pi type orbitals and antibonding pi type orbitals. The one you see is a simple bonding pi type orbital. Notice that the electron density is higher between the nuclei, pulling them together. And here's an antibonding pi type molecular orbital. Notice the electron density is away from the nuclei, pulling them apart. One of the great strengths of molecular orbital theory is its ability to predict the electron energy levels in molecules. 
This is something that other models like valence bond and VSEPR can't do. With MO theory, we can create energy levels on an energy level diagram for the orbitals in a molecule, just as we did for atomic orbitals in an atom. Here's the energy level diagram for a simple molecule like dihydrogen. Notice that instead of giving each orbital an atomic orbital name like S or P, in this case we give each orbital a molecular orbital name like sigma or pi. We identify whether the orbital is bonding or antibonding by putting an asterisk beside the antibonding orbital name. Notice that the lowest energy molecular orbital for dihydrogen is the sigma type orbital, and that the next highest in energy is the sigma star type orbital. Let's put the shapes of the molecular orbitals beside the energy levels. Now do you remember how we added electrons to atomic orbitals? We do the same with molecular orbitals. We put the electrons on the lowest orbital first, and then continue to add electrons until we've used them all up. Each molecular orbital can accommodate two electrons. In H2, each molecule has a total of two electrons, one from each hydrogen atom. So those two electrons add to the energy levels this way. The first electron goes into the sigma, and the second also into the sigma bonding. From an energy level diagram like this, we can actually calculate for a diatomic molecule its bond order. In molecular orbital theory, having two electrons in a bonding type orbital is the equivalent of one bond. It's fair to say then that having one electron in a bonding type orbital would be the equivalent of how much? Half a bond. So in this hydrogen molecule, we have two electrons in a bonding type orbital, and therefore the bond order is one. That's probably what you would have predicted just from the Lewis dot structure of hydrogen, right? Now, what if we were to take one of those electrons away to form the H2 plus ion? What would be the bond order then? Well, we have one electron in a bonding type orbital, and that's the equivalent of half a bond so the bond order is 0.5. Now let's restore the electron we took off. In fact, let's add another electron to the hydrogen molecule. Where will that electron go? Well, it will adopt the net next orbital up, the sigma star, the sigma antibonding orbital waveform. Because that extra electron is in an antibonding orbital, it actually pulls the molecule apart to some extent. How much? Well, the equivalent of half a bond. So, with an extra electron in the hydrogen molecule, we actually have less bonding. One bond resulting from the two electrons in the bonding orbital, but part of that cancelled by the one electron in the antibonding orbital. The net bond order for this ion, then, is 0.5. Notice that by adding electrons to antibonding orbitals, you actually weaken or cancel out the bonding that was already there to some degree. So let's see if you got the idea. If we added an additional electron to the ion to make it a 2 minus ion, what would be the bond order then? Well, the bond order would be 1 minus 1, which is 0. We can make a general formula for calculating bond order in a diatomic molecule. It looks like this. The bond order is equal to the number of electrons in bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals, all divided by 2. Well, that's just a brief taste of what can be a very long and complicated topic. Perhaps your teacher will want to go into more detail. In the meantime, toodaloo!